Hallelujah. I don't wake you up. We ought to do that, you know, periodically during a message and everything. Just walk up and down the aisle and, uh, and uh, sound a shofar blast. It would uh, encourage people to say, oh my goodness, what's going on? I, I, I need to wake up here. Amen. Well, welcome to our service tonight. We're going to have a good time in the word of the Lord and just kind of focus in on what this is all about. If you have your Bibles, if you're joining us, by the way, on uh, Facebook, welcome. We're we're glad that you've chosen to spend some time with us on this Moed. In the book of Leviticus, it's also in the book of Numbers, but the book of Leviticus chapter 23 is uh, the list of the appointed festivals of Yahweh. And, and every year I want to review this. In fact, many times during the year I want to keep reviewing this. And in Leviticus 23, the first two verses, it says, Yahweh said to Moses... Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed feasts, the appointed feasts of Yahweh, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. These are not Jewish feasts. These are not Jewish celebrations, though the Jewish people have been the ones who, who have carried it uh, throughout history. Uh, these are appointed times. Appointed times, the Hebrew word there is moed, the plural for that is moedim. And the moeds are time in the midst of space as we know it, where Yahweh has said these are vital enough for me as your creator to say that on through eternity you must observe them. You must observe them. And there's seven Moedim that he picks out. He calls them his times. He tells us in most cases uh, how to celebrate them and what they're about. But the, the key thing is it's, it's his. Right. It, it's his appointment. And, and I think there's a shifting coming uh, in the body of Yeshua uh, o over the bulk of today and actually starting yesterday and even last week. You know, I, I've been watching a lot of... Uh, Messianic congregations, you know, from small ones like ours to large, large ones with over a thousand people uh, who are celebrating the Moeds of God and, you know, finding out that there, there's a hunger in the body of Yeshua for people to get right with God. What I mean by get right is, is not just to be in a place where one's sins are forgiven and covered by the blood of the Lamb, but so we're plugged into His world. His world, not doing our thing, but, but trying to find out what, what his thing is and seeing how we can, as much as possible, begin to live out what it is that Yahweh put in front of us. Uh, when we, we come to times like this, and, and uh, tonight's going to be a fun one because we, we've got fun things to do with it. And I do mean fun and it's, it's awesome and it's, it's holy and we're going to find out what religion does with it, which is not what we want to do with it. But the, the Moeds of God are evidence of a deity, a creator, who lives in a dimension far beyond our dimension. It's got to be that way. It's got to be that way. Uh, you know, anybody who thinks that, that the universe and the awesomeness of the, of the world, just their own little world called Earth, let alone our, our own little galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, and I say little in the sense of what we've come to understand of the vastness of the universe. It was a time when the Milky Way galaxy seemed impossibly large uh, to uh, scientists and investigators of times past, but we know now it's just a little cosmic piece of dust among hundreds of billions of galaxies. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I just like to run, brush my mind up against that every once in a while to, to, you know, to shake me up and remind me two things. Number one, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. But secondly, to remind you that's my Father who made all that. Amen. My Father operates in a dimension that we can't even begin to understand and approach. And therefore, the best of our science, the best of our human knowledge falls 
far short, far short. That's why we cannot go to the world's philosophers. We, can't go, we cannot go to the world's scientists and say, tell us what this is all about. They don't know. The best of science is totally incapable of defining what your mind is. Oh, I, I can define what your brain is, because your brain is simply a composite of neurons and electrical chemical interactions going on. And I, I can tell what parts of the brain affect what matters of your thinking. But I know quite well that you are not your brain. Amen. That there is something that makes you, you, beyond your personality, uh, be, beyond anything that's biochemical, medical, that there's something that makes you, you, and science doesn't even attempt to, to explain it. Uh, they leave it up to metaphysics and philosophers because it's, it's beyond the reach of what can be measured. But interestingly, the vast majority of scientists know it's there. <laughs> they, they, they know it, it, it's there. And, and so we dare to believe, because uh, you only have, I think, two choices. Uh, you, you, you really only have one choice about creation. There is a creator. There's got to be. Yeah, it, there, there's got to be. There's too much design and organization in the world to think it happened by chance. It does never happen by chance like this. You know, you, you, you gotta have weird faith to believe that it just evolved. You, no, 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 there's a, there's a guiding intelligence. Now whether you believe that guiding intelligence is personal or not, you've gotta believe that, that somewhere, be, that, that, that behind all of this, there is an intelligence we can't even begin to fathom and, and the Bible doesn't even try to explain it either. It simply says this. In the beginning, God said. That's, right. That's it. Now, you choose to believe it or not, okay? Uh, I choose to believe it. it. It makes perfect sense. But what also makes sense is this. That if there's a God who is so intimately connected with the world to the point where down to the minutest detail of biochemical uh, interactions among the species of how, you know, different animals have been given different qualities that enable them to live out their life in a way that is totally unique and, and, and it's like with the diversity, the biodiversity in this world, it's like, my goodness, Yahweh is, is, is a detailed person. Yes, he is. You know, he knows whether my tie's straight or not. You know, how, you know, when Yeshua talked about he knows the hairs on your head, well, of course he does. You know, if he can keep track of all the phylum and all the different insect worlds and, and all that's going on and understand the concepts of nuclear physics and, and what causes the universe to... If, if his mind as creator can handle all of that, then he is a detailed person. And so it makes sense that such a deity, such a creator, would desire to communicate with his creation. Why would you build a house never to live in it? Or if you're a builder, why would you build a mansion for somebody and never periodically want to drive by and take a look at it again? It's your handiwork. You know, how, how would, you know, you, you want to create something with your life, you want to be involved in it, even as parents, when we bring children into this world, we want to be involved in their life, and no matter how much they mess up, we want to hold out the hope that they'll straighten up. And when they do straighten up, they're going to find out we're still mom, we're still dad. Come on. Come on. Well, why would we think that there's such a thing as a superior intelligence that created all that we see, all that was, is, or ever will be, and that wouldn't want to be involved in his creation to somehow there should be an interaction going on, and that's exactly what the Bible says. That's why I say it may not be politically correct, but there is no religious book anywhere in this planet that can even strike a match against the Bible. None whatsoever. The Quran doesn't come close. Amen. The biggest thing that these religious books cannot do is prophesy the future. 
demonstrated prophecies. I'm not just saying you can't say things, but have a long history. I said this would be, it would be, and it came to be. I said this would be, people said impossible, and it came to be. Thousands of words in the scriptures predicting future events which have already taken place. So the Bible we dare to believe is God's revelation to us. It's not one of many. It's not a religious book. It is the revelation of the Creator. And it's what the Creator is trying to communicate with, with you and I about how this creation is supposed to work. And the challenge that the Creator has is He gave us free will. Which means you have the ability to tell Him to go take a hike. Amen. When He's the only one that knows where the path is. <laughs> Come on. He gave you free will to do that. And, and so man comes and the, the record of the scriptures is one of continually man trying to control and manipulate the revelation. I, I want to get hold of the revelation called Torah and, and I want to I wanna make it mine and so I want to control it so I'm going to tell you what the Torah means and, and, and therefore we develop religion. Mankind is inherently religion. And here's what religion is. Religion is not a pathway to the deity. Religion is controlling the deity. That's worth your coming to tonight. Just to get your, your whole education cha changed and turn around. Religion is not a pathway to the deity. Whatever your deity happens to be. Religion is your attempt to control the deity. And so you get your doctrines and you define God will do this and God won't do this. The challenge is this. You're operating out of a time-space dimension that is created and he's trying to communicate from a dimension that was not created. That's right. yes. Which is so far superior that at one point, Yeshua said, I have much more I could tell you, but you can't bear it. What did he mean? Your brain can't handle it. I'm going to tell you truths that, you, that you're just not going to be able to handle. And so we live in a day and age now. Are, are you still with me? Yes. I mean, I'm following Holy Spirit here. And I'm, he's leading us somewhere, and I'm excited about it. Yes. <laughs> they... they, they the challenge that we have is we're trying to speak into a culture from another dimension and the culture doesn't want to hear it. And so out of the arrogance of humanity, I think that my years of life have made me an expert. Okay, I think, yes, I'm sure. I've got more years than anybody in this, in this place, so I'm the expert expert. Okay, I've got 77 years under my belt. And based on those 77 years, I, I see what's happening in history. I understand science. Uh, you know, I, I told my mother once, you know, when she was a little girl, the Wright brothers flew an airplane, and when she was a senior citizen, man landed on the moon. In one lifetime, from you can't fly till you're on the moon. One person's lifetime. And, and, and so because I like to read a lot of science and I like to read a lot of, of, of technical things and, uh, about history, it's very easy for me to think I know it all. Meaning this, I can draw conclusions and I can say this can be and this can't be. Based on my experience, this will never work. Well, great, what do I have? My experience out of what's the population of the world? I don't know now, 8 billion or whatever it is. My, my experience? Come on. And, 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 and so I've got to turn to another source that's outside my experience and, and let that begin to speak to me. So, so let me give you a quick few examples of that and then we're going we're gonna to get right into what's going on here tonight. But, but you've got to understand, when you come into the festivals, you have a choice. You come into them as a human being with a religion or you 
stretch and reach and say there's more here than meets the eye. And I dare to believe that the sounds of another dimension can begin to penetrate through whether it's Yom Turah, Yom Kippur, Passover, doesn't make any difference, but there is an ability to hear into a dimension that cannot be explained. That's right. That's right. You, you need to grab that. Because the warfare that we're involved in in this planet is a war of, of light and darkness, of good and evil. And that which is evil is keeping humanity bound because they keep us limited to what our mind can understand and comprehend. Mm -hmm. And therefore we're told this can't be, that can't be. Let me just, let me give you a few of these without getting off the track here. And, and we take a child and we put him into an education system and then the, the priests of the education system that would be the teachers and the guidance counselors. Come on, education is a religion. The priests of the education system begin to tell you what your child is capable of or not capable of. And they begin to grade them. Johnny, you know, in first grade is a C student. And they label him and guess what happens? Johnny remains a C student through most of his life because Mom says, well, you know, Johnny's a C student. Everybody buys into what the priest told you. Based on what? Based on what? Come on, science itself knows that we use only a small fraction of our brains, even the smartest of us. Everybody birthed into this planet has a mind that is capable of astounding things. I think of uh, uh, Stephen Hawking who had a terrible disease and didn't have answers for that and got to the point where he couldn't speak and couldn't move and had to communicate you know, in very difficult ways but, but had a brilliant mind that thought out into the edges of the universe. But the priests of education tell us what can and cannot be. Let's get into another field. Let's talk about the medical a field. The priests of the medical, I'm not against education and I'm not against medicine, I'm against the control of it which has become religious. Amen. And religion never will admit I missed it. And so the religious priests of the 1800s made definitive statements about medically what could and couldn't be done but they were wrong. They're still making definitive statements about it. Mm -hmm. And growing whole denominational, medical denominations I call them. Mm -hmm. the, the whole uh, oncology movement, the standard procedure, and I'm not saying that for some people it doesn't work, but it's standard to the extent that other ways are not accepted. Other ways are not accepted. Okay, so you're going to get surgery and you're going to get radiation treatment. Well, what about this? We don't believe that. There's no evidence. I was reading uh, t t yesterday about, uh, you know, some different kind of natural medicines that have been used for, for curing infections and things like that for over 100 years. And, and uh, so I'm looking it up on the, on the internet to find out what people have to say about it. And it's like most things. WebMD, uh, you go to any of the medical channels and they're going to say it's not proven, it's not proven. Yeah. At, 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 at worst, they're going to say it could be dangerous, but they don't have any evidence that it's dangerous. But it's not proven is the byline. Why isn't it proven? Why if you've got a population that says we're using this natural ingredient and getting these certain results, why is it not proven? Let me tell you why it's not proven in the one I was looking up. So I'm proven for a simple reason. How do you prove it? You do medical trials. You do medical trials. And by the way, if you believe every medical trial, you're a fool. That's right. Because people are people. And there are liars in the pharmaceutical industry just like there's liars in every place in, in our society. And they choose to read results. They want a result. 
want to see because if you've invested 500 million dollars in a drug you don't want to come to a conclusion it doesn't work so you're going to make the evidence say that it does and you're going to put it out there and, and only 10 years after it's in the marketplace do they begin to find out oh my goodness people are dying do you know why they don't I say well why don't they simply do medical trials because natural substances cannot be patented. Think of it. How, how am I going to invest 100 million dollars to run a test to see whether, you know, licorice root does this or doesn't do that and come to the conclusion after I've spent 100 million dollars and I've used placebo, some have a placebo, some have the real thing and I track them for 10 years and I finally come up with the evidence, yes, it actually helps. How do I get my 100 million dollars back because I can't patent licorice? It's a natural substance. Come on. People, oh no, I can't. Yes, it is that crass. And I'm not blaming them. I'm not blaming them. I just think our government should stop giving money to subsidize pharmaceuticals to do it and put our taxpayer money into doing these things that the businessman isn't going to do. I understand there's no money in that. Then why don't we do it? Okay? And, and so what you develop is a polarized world. And, and in the realm of health, there's a polarized world between those who believe that there are natural answers to everything and, and those who believe all of that is a bunch of hogwash and it doesn't work. And they're, they're polarized. Uh, in the realm of education, you, you have uh, it's, it's very polarized, okay? Even to the extent, for example, teachers unions don't want uh, charter schools, which is public education. Charter schools are public education. I, I couldn't understand why they were against charter schools because linked to charter schools is free choice and they never want to go to free choice because then consumers are going to say, I'm not going to send my child to your school because you're not producing tangible results. And so there's this, there's this tremendous conflict where I don't even want you to be part of it. So those of us involved in homeschooling, we're in a counter-cultural movement. By the way, it, it continues to go rapidly. There's tens of millions of children in America being homeschooled. But, but the education establishment still wants to put down homeschool. You say, well, that can never happen. It's happened throughout Europe. If you're living in Germany right now and you choose to homeschool, very likely you're going to end up in jail and have your children taken away from you. And homeschooling parents in Germany and Sweden basically are being forced to leave their country because the government will come in and say, you have no right. We don't trust you to teach the children what we know they need to know. And, you know, it, 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 it may or may not happen in America. Okay? So what am I saying? There's that polarization. So, so what has this got to do with Yom Teruah? That there's a polarization within the the Judeo-Christian community about what is real and what isn't. And the vast majority of people in both those communities believe what I can feel, touch, and handle, that's real. And all this other stuff, yeah, we believe God's there, but I've never seen God. And, and so I read his word not as a word from another dimension trying to open my eyes and ears, but I read it as a book that humans wrote and I am more advanced in my knowledge than Moses was or Jeremiah was or Isaiah was. Oh, you are? Let me see you give out 25 prophecies about a coming Messiah down to the T, where he's going to be born, what's going to happen in his life. Let me see you do that if you're so much smarter than Isaiah. But if you see Isaiah as just a man walking around doing manly things, human things, and you don't realize we have a revelation because that's how Yahweh chose to speak to us. Well, I, I, I wish he sp had chosen a different way. There's many times, to, to me it would be really great if we came in here and I'm just the cheerleader. I'm the, I'm the startup warm-up band when the real deal's going to happen. And we got two minutes and then I'm going to take a seat and, and out of that wall, Yahweh is going to speak. I'm glad you all came tonight. There's a word I have to share with you. 
In fact, I have a word for each one of you. Scott, Donna, Gabriel, and he starts going down one by one, calling us front and center to speak to us. There's a scariness to that because he knows what the rest of you don't know. But, but wouldn't that be neat? We all gather in, and hear voices, but that's not what he created. He created communication coming out of relationship. And so while in the midst of all that we're supposed to do, and in the midst of 613 mitzvahs, okay, the, the vast majority of which just are common sense, don't steal. Oh, well, how spiritual do you have to be to realize stealing isn't very good? Amen? No, not amen. California, in 2014, realized they had a terrible incarceration rate in the state, and people were being locked up for stealing. And the limit for making that a felony, felony meaning they're going to go to jail if you're found guilty, was something like uh, $450. If you stole something less than $450, you got fined, you had, you, but you didn't go to jail. But if it was over $450, we sent you to, to, to jail. And, and they got this brilliant idea that we've got too many people in jail. So let's raise the limit. And here was their expectation. We're going to make the limit, I think it's 950 or 1,000. So, so that whatever, whatever you steal over that, well, you can be convicted of a felony, but below that you're not going to be convicted of a felony. And that's going to bring the crime rate down. <laughs> Well, you all just said that it's very obvious that stealing is, we don't need God's law to tell us that. That's, no, no, no. They just said, you're not really stealing unless it goes over a certain level. So they just came out uh, with a report this year because it's five years and they, what has happened in five years is that theft has gone up, but so has the incarceration rate. So we're getting both things bad. In other words, more people are stealing, but still more people are going to jail. Why? Because they, they learned, well, I get away with this, maybe I can get away with the $1,500 and they won't, you know. I mean, it, it, it's crazy. So I just made a statement that we all thought was pretty, you don't need the mitzvahs to find out thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. As a society, we, we agree that's, a, 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 you know, you don't have to be religious, you know. Even the mafia, I'm led to believe, has a good standard about that one. You don't mess with another mafia's guy's wife. You just don't do that. You, 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 might, you might kill him because he did something wrong, but you don't mess with his wife. That, that's just not the code. And, and there's a whole underworld subculture that will bury you in cement, but they won't mess with your wife. You don't, you don't have to be religious to, to, to see that some of these things make sense, okay? But Yahweh tells us why. And in the book of Proverbs, Yahweh says, you know, you can be forgiven for stealing anything except a man's wife. That man will never forgive you. Wow. Interesting. He gets down to the dynamics of humanness. So Yahweh is speaking from another dimension, and in his speaking, most of the, most of the things make sense, except when it comes to the festivals. And when it comes to the Moed, Yahweh says, thou shalt do this. I want you to do this on the first day. I want you to do this on the tenth day. You know, for seven, seven days you shall eat, eat uh, unleavened bread. What? Matzah? Have, God, have you eaten matzah for seven days? I mean, you take the leaven out of the bread. I mean, it's pretty tasteless. It's cardboard, you know, and put some salt and pepper on it. You know, uh, it's a fast day. You shall afflict yourself. Uh, okay, are you some kind of a weird God that takes delight in us going around and 
feeding ourselves or our religion the world that do that, by the way. In Christianity, there's, there's a whole sect of people that flail their bodies till they're cut to represent what the, what the Savior went through. In the midst of all this, we, we, we come up with seven Moedim. And Yahweh says, you will keep them, and these are my ordinances forever. These are my festivals forever. And then you read that when we come into the millennium reign of, of Yeshua, when he reigns for a thousand years from Jerusalem, and, and there's total peace on the earth, we still need to keep them. And in fact, if a nation won't keep them, there's a penalty attached to it so that if a nation, if the United States at that time exists, and, and we don't send our representatives to Jerusalem for tabernacles, our nation will experience famine. This is serious stuff. Far more serious than all the other mitzvahs are the seven Moedim. And m most of them we can, we can wrap our head around it at one level or another, but we come to this one. Yam Teruah. If I go out in the world and say, come and join us, it's Yam Teruah. They're going to say, what? No, no, no. It's uh, Rosh Hashan Hashanah. No, it isn't. You won't find that in the Bible. It's not what the Bible calls it. Glory to God. So in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24, Yahweh spoke to Moses and said, Say to the Israelites, on the first day of the seventh month, you're to have a day of rest, a day of sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts. Do no regular work, but present an offering made to Yahweh with fire. On the seventh month, on the first day. Interestingly, of the seven Moedim, this is the only festival on the first day of a month. They're either on the tenth day of the month or the fifteenth day of the month, but only Yom Teruah is on the first day of a month, right away. It's marked as different. Secondly, th this is the only of the seven Moeds that Yahweh doesn't definitively say what it's about. Why? Passover? What's Passover about? Well, we're, we're remembering the exodus from Egypt from which we draw all kinds of lessons about how Yahweh works in our life. Okay. But we come to this one and there's, and there's no do it because of this. It's, it's kind of like an open-ended moed. And, and I'm coming to believe that we're going to find out in the millennium that this moed is far more expansive than all the others put together. Because it's not saying this is about the cross, this is about the exodus, this is about bringing your harvest in, this is about uh, remembering how you didn't have places to dwell so now you're dwelling in booths. We're going to find out this one has an unlimited scope of impacting your life. Now, if you wonder why I'm excited about that, because we've been celebrating the Moeds for, I don't know, what, 15 years or so now? And, and this is the one that's kind of like, okay, it's the least of the ones mm -hmm. that I could wrap my head around or get energized about. And it's the least of the ones you can go online and begin to f and find out what is it all about. But increasingly, especially within the Messianic community, people are beginning to say, we need to figure out what's going on. Yes. Glory to God. Why? Because the creator of the universe could have chosen five, six, seven, a dozen, whatever. He chose seven times every year where he said this is vital for you to understand. It's vital for you to understand. It impacts your life at a level that transcends your ability to comprehend simply within the earth realm. You can understand Passover without being born again, without having the Spirit of God working in your life. I don't believe you'll ever understand Yom Teruah if there's not the Spirit of God 
operating in your life. Glory to God. You still with me? Yes. I mean, does that, does that cause some, I, I, want, I want to know about this? Yes. Glory to God. If I tell you we're going to spend three hours doing it, are you still with me? Yes. <laughs> no, well, tomorrow's a, a Sabbath day. We're in the Sabbath day, so no, I'm not going to spend three hours. Now, I, I, I want, by the way, I said, no, nowhere in Scripture is it called Rosh Hashanah. Uh, Yom Teruah uh, is, it, the word Teruah means a, a blast, a sound, a, a, a loud proclamation. The King James Bible uh, translates that verse, a memorial of blowing of trumpets. The NIV it says this day is to be commemorated with trumpet blasts. The Amplified says it's a memorial day announced by the blowing of trumpets. The Message Bible says loud blasts on the ram's horn. And uh, Stern's uh, Contemporary Jewish Bible says a day of complete rest for remembering. So one of the key words, because what does it mean? Well, let's start looking in it to find out. It's a day of remembering that is somehow or other connected to sound. You know, your senses are amazing. All your, your, your five senses are connected to the, the computer that runs your body. Lose your computer, you're in trouble. Okay? The, the brain. The brain regulates your breathing, regulates your blood, blood flow. You can do things that, 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 that are very difficult, and the brain tries to send out messages to you. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't smoke that. Don't drink that. Don't eat that uh, because you're damaging the body. And, and, uh, but everything, everything that has come into your life through any of the five senses is recorded. Now, I don't know how many... I don't even know what the phrase is now, terabytes, or what, what is the biggest thing we can talk about, mega gigabytes, or what, I, I don't know. Of knowledge is out there on the internet now, but it's astounding. Do a search, and up it comes. You know, 10, ten seconds, and we found 5,328,221 uh, answers. How? How'd you even count that in that space, let alone find them? How, how, how do I... How do I put in a question here and the answer to it is sitting on a server somewhere else in the world like in India, but in, in, a, in a second the answer's on my screen. I mean, I, just physically, what left my house and got to India and got back to my house that quick? What? Electronic pulses? How, how do they go that fast? I, I mean, think about it. The answer's physically sitting on a server out there somewhere shows up on mine. Hmm. Absolutely amazing things. And, and in the midst of this, everything that you've smelled, heard, whatever. I, I, years ago, and this is my favorite illustration for this, because when I was younger, like around 8, 9, 10, my, I spent my summers with my grandfather at his apple orchard down in uh, Cheshire, Connecticut. And that barn had had apples in it all the time. We spent days packing apples in there and then once a week carted them off to the market in the, in the farm truck. And it's amazing to me. I can tell you right when it happens, but I never go there thinking it's going to happen. Over at Bolton Orchards. And if I go to Bolton Orchards, I haven't been there probably in about four or five years. But if I'm driving the areas and said, oh, I want to see what they have for apples, I'm not, I, it's not even in my mind. Oh, this is what happens when you go here. I'm not thinking that. I open the door and walk in, and I walk into the back, and as I breathe in that smell of the apple barn, I'm instantly in the barn in Cheshire, Connecticut. I, I could begin to describe things at that moment that I would find more difficult and challenging to describe now. I, I'm, I'm not describing them because I'm remembering them, I'm describing them because I'm living them once again. Right. And what triggered that living? What, what brought the picture of the barn? What, there's the sorting machine over there, and there's the, the, the boxes that are empty over there, and there's where the uh, forklift brings them in over there, and, and, and I'm beginning, I, as I'm breathing, I'm seeing, if I close my eyes, I am, I'm standing right there, and it's all there. 
How did my brain bring all those pictures up? How, how did my brain say, Don, you know, do you remember this? Boom, and it starts flashing pictures up. How did, how, I mean, my brain instantly brings those pictures up. But what triggered it? The smell. Come on. You, you can hear a sound. Mm -hmm. And the sound has attached to it uh, either something that is scary or something that is, is uh, soothing. Mm -hmm. And just the sound of a voice can create uh, feelings within you, uh, even if it's in another language. In our high-tech team, uh, product team, in, uh, when I was in the high-tech industry, we would have presentations on our products, and I was the one to put all the graphics together, but we had a woman in our team, and she did the presentations. She was not the sharpest-looking woman. She I, I, I just don't, she didn't strike me as being necessarily the smartest woman. And we laugh at a team, as a team as we learn to leverage each other's gifts. And I said one day to the team, I said, I know why our manager asked Fiona to give the presentation. Now, we all thought it, but nobody was talking about it. Why does, why does she always get picked? <laughs> so I said, I found out why. I sit there one day, and I know why. I watched the people as she's talking. She was Irish. And she had this deep Irish accent. And the Irish accent just has an attractiveness to it. I said, you know, I could get up and say the exact same thing, <laughs> word for word, and they'd get bored or look away. But they stayed glued on what she's saying and took notes, and, and they, were, they were engrossed with her accent. Come on. It, 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 it was a sound. So I believe of, of all the, the Moedim, this is the one that is directly connected with sound. The shofar. The shofar. The shofar. The shofar. Scott, play a, play a couple of things on that for us again. So quick little sounds. The, the sound of the shofar goes somewhere where other things won't. That's right. That's right. I, I've, I've heard it all over the place. We could come up here, turn on the organ, and, and play a chord on the organ. And there are chords that will move you, but nothing will do what the shofar does. That's right. That's right. And, and, and we need to, with our shofar players, we have got to move to the next level. Yes, we do. We have got to. You know, uh, there, there is a level that, that, that of, of the sound that absolutely opens the other dimension. Right. Absolutely does. And, and we, we've got to have a goal to get there. But that sound penetrates. That, that sound can stop people. It can stop people. We, yes, we see it on the 4th of July parade when the Shofars, as people ask, what is that, and everything like that. There's a sound in that. That's God's instrument. Isn't it interesting that when Yeshua returns, what is the mark of his return? There will be a great shout and the sound of the shofar. What do you mean a great shout? Imagine 10,000 angels shouting out, he's here. <laughs> Whoa, I mean, the whole heavens will... Do you know in the heavens around the planet, people are hearing sounds, they don't know what they are, and they're freaking out at it. Mm -hmm. They tend to be primarily in the northern hemisphere, but the last time I read up about it, scientists still don't know what it is. Sometimes it has a very mechanical uh, sound to it, so they're assuming it was some kind of, but like you're in northern Canada, there's no, there's nothing around, there's no factories or anything. What is making this sound? And people will just come out of their houses, and, and they're staring up into the heavens, because the heavens are making a sound. I believe the heavens have always been making sounds, but those sounds are beginning to come now into our dimension. The very earth itself will groan, come on, will groan under the weight of sin. Sounds are very important. 
So, so what, what, what do we see there that the only thing he tells us is, listen, this is a day you need to put it apart. You set it apart. It's a Sabbath day. And mark it with the sound of the shofar. So the rabbis come up with a tradition. We're going to blow the shofar a hundred times. And, and we've got these different sounds. We make this sound, that sound, that sound. Uh, you know, and that's fine, but that's not what it's about. It's about sounds that will begin to break through into, into your life and change your life. I don't want to teach you about the other dimension. I want you to hear it. Because once you hear it, you'll never forget it. And once you hear it, it takes precedence over everything in your life. I've shared this before, but uh, you know, my pastor, Pastor Jonathan, was preaching down at our home church, and this was years and years ago, and I just have a belief that Yahweh never wastes my time. If I'm in the place where I belong, Yahweh's going to speak to me. So if I go to a meeting, he's going to speak to me. He didn't say, well, sit there for two hours, but I don't have anything to say to you. Just enjoy it and support other people. And I'm sitting there that night, and Pastor Jonathan is preaching a good sermon. I'm sure it was a good sermon. But he came to then and he, he folded his notes and said, he said, well, that's it for tonight. And I sat there dumbfounded. I mean, it was a good message. But I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that I had not heard a word that jumped out at me and said, this is for you, Don. I always hear from my father. My father always has something to say to me. Some things are nicer than other things. Sometimes he encourages and sometimes he slaps me to encourage me. But, but I always know. I know right where it is. You know, sometimes when I'm preaching, he's, he'll drop it right in there and I know that's for me. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes he doesn't give a word. He get, keeps talking and I'm trying to preach while he's talking. That's very challenging. But, but I believe it. So that night I sat there and I, you know, everybody's getting up ready to shake hands and everything. I'm just sitting, I'm dumbfounded. And, and I, I, I said within myself, I said, Father, what, how did I miss it? Uh, how did I miss it? I, I cannot have sat here for a whole hour. And, and, and How did I miss it? And just about that time, Pastor Jonathan turned around, walked back to the Pope, and he said, there's one more thing I need to say. And the very next words out of his mouth had my name written all over them. Do you think this guy wasn't excited? <laughs> Do you think I'm less convinced that Yahweh will always speak to me? Even then, how did I miss it? I didn't miss it. He hadn't said it yet. Come on. Why? I, I believe that, that we need to say, teach us your ways, Yahweh. And his way is to impart into you at a level of sound that is so real, you, you say, well, Yahweh told me, and you might have to explain to people, well, I don't mean I heard it with these ears, but I heard it in here, and it was so much more real than if I heard it with my ears. You, you can run for a long time on a word like that. Two, two years ago, I, you know, I was talking, uh, some information came to me, and Yahweh instantly gave me an answer. Instantly. Instantly gave me the answer. Bing! That is so locked into me, it, it's like, uh, I've heard from God. I don't care what else goes on. I've heard from God. I know what God told. See, God's told some of you things, but you let go of it. God promised you a future, but you've let go of the future. God said he'd take care of you, and you went out and said, yeah, I heard from God, and you did, but then you didn't see the answer right away, or it took a year, or two, or five. Who cares if Yahweh gave you the word? Abraham, you're going to have a child. He went a long time before that came into fulfillment, and long beyond his natural ability to produce children. That's what faith is. It's, it's not that the Bible says it. It's not that the pastor preached it. It's that I heard from God. How, how can I ever alter my life from the fact that I was a, a good church-going boy, my family went to church, I was in youth group, did all that, 
but at the age of 16, you know, I'm in an evangelistic crusade in a little Pentecostal church, and for the first time began to realize, I know the Bible, I know things about it, and I know that, and I believe in Jesus, but I'm not saved. He's not Lord of my life. He's not the master of my life. And I'm sitting there realizing, I don't want to walk out in that street, you know, not taking care of this. So I gave my life to the Lord, and you've heard me tell this, I'm sure. That night I went home, climbed into the top bunk of where my brother and I had bunk beds. I got my Bible out. I had a Bible. I knew where the books were. I knew how to read it. I opened the Bible, and it was an entirely different book. My goodness. It's like a personal friend is writing to me. It's like a love letter from a lover. I'm, I'm reading it and it's like the, the words are jumping off the page and hitting me. This is for you. This is for you. This is for you. And instead of my, you know, 20 minute, 15 minute reading, man, I was up for a couple hours turning pages and it's like, where did this book come from? I stopped reading the Bible from this dimension and began to allow Yahweh from his dimension to speak through those words. Are, are you getting a hold of this? There's another dimension we need to get to. There needs to be sounds that, that, that impact you, that, 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 that come through and, and say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I don't want to miss that. That's right. We have music playing in our house 24 hours a day, music or teaching. Right. Or both, sometimes. Yeah, that's right, on one side of the bed we got music playing, and the other side of the bed we got... Uh, word playing, you know, and, and uh, I, I, you know, your mind is totally, I'm going to sleep, but Yahweh, you never sleep or slumber. And this, this recorder is never going to sleep or slumber because I got it on repeat. So I'm going to lay my body down and I'm going to sleep, but, but those words are still going to come in and into my mind. And I find out some, some nights I'm just laying there and all of a sudden I'm hearing the words. I'm consciously hearing. I'm always hearing them. But I'm consciously hearing words. And all of a sudden I think, I've never heard that. Mm -hmm. now, now wait a minute, I've been playing this thing for over a year. What do you mean you never heard it? I've never heard that. And, and so like, well that's interesting. No, 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 I've never heard it. I, I just heard a sound from somewhere else. Amen. The, 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 same, the same CD, the same thumb drive that's playing what, what it was, the same message, it's the same thing, it's Brother Hagen or it's, it's Brother Keith Moore or, or whoever it is, you know, and, 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 and I know they never said that. Well, obviously they did say it. I know I never heard it. <laughs> I never heard what I'm hearing. And there's times in the night when I wake up out, out of a sleep, I wake up. I mean, I don't just, no, I wake up. And, 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 and it's like many times Donna will tell you, I'm out of the bed, I'm over there, get into my Kindle and start looking up that verse. It's like, how did I never see that? And sometimes it's an hour later. <laughs> and, and it's like, I'm energized, I'm filled with life. It's like Yahweh said, hey, I'm going to disturb your sleep. I want to give you one hour to download from my dimension truth that will set you free. Pour it on. Most Christians don't have an idea what I'm talking about. But it's there for you. It's there for you. You got to believe it's, it's not that, that, that he's holding it back and you got to make some superhuman effort. No, you got to make the effort. If you don't, if you don't have the, the CD playing, then guess what? You're not going to hear it. Amen. But how much effort does it take to make sure I've got that? I can't tell you uh, how many times Donna and I are just, we're just startled by members of our churches that we've had who they, they're in the hospital and we say, where's your CD player? What, what do you mean you're in the hospital without a CD player? You got the TV blasting out as the stomach turns. You got doctors and nurses coming in with all manner of evil. Where's your CD player to pump in life? And they've sat under our teaching sometimes for years and years and years. Oh, I'm a word person. I listen to the word. No, you don't. If you can't read, did you remember to put your clothes on to go to the hospital? <laughs> Then, then it should be as natural that I take that with me at a moment of crisis. That's right. 
because it's a sound that ministers to me oh I'm bored with it I've heard it no then you've never heard it this is serious stuff this is the most serious of the moeds Amen. and that's why he had to have sound and shouting and shofars blasting to try to wake you up the sound of the shofar some somehow you know it's not a natural sound you can't kind of uh, it, it, it's going to penetrate you the sound of Yahweh's word yes, glory to God let me see where I want to go for are you okay yes. glory to God I, I want to try to wrap this up somewhere except I got five pages of notes and I'm nowhere on them at all so let me just share some things with you about, about this, this particular talk yes, uh, to show you how much we don't know you know when is the rapture going to take place and, and people say well we can't know that because Yeshua said no man knows the day or the hour and, and I've heard a lot of people say well therefore we don't know we just have faith it could, it could be today well you know that's not true it, it's not true to say Yeshua could have been born at any time because the Bible says at the appointed time he was born so, so Yahweh had a plan from his dimension exactly to the day and hour when Yeshua was going to enter this world it couldn't be any time well he's God no no he is God but he chose a time and place Yahweh from that dimension says uh, th th listen you can say I want to go see the eclipse well it isn't going to happen for another six months well I'm going to stand out and look for it anyway <laughs> well have a good every six months you're no 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 we know in this orderly universe when the, the a lunar eclipse is going to happen and a solar eclipse and we know where it's going to go and we know what parts of the country it's going to come across and we know what time and hour it's going to come across come on you, you can say well you know when, no no you know when it's going to happen there is an appointed time yes there is and people who begin to understand how Yahweh from his dimension is trying to give us clues uh, through the Moeds well it's got to be on a Moed because he does things on Moeds okay and the fact that at his return there's going to be a shout and a shofar leads us to believe it very likely will be Yom Teruah but 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 Yeshua said no man knows the day or the hour that's because you're a Gentile you don't have a clue what he said that's right I didn't have a clue of what he said I'm a Gentile reading a Jewish book what did the people in Yeshua's day standing there when he said no man knows the day or the hour what did they know he was saying they knew that he was saying it's going to be on Yom Turah you just don't know which one of them it's going to be but that's when it's going to be well how could they know that when he said that cuz here's how they determined when Shabbat began okay it's when they uh, or uh, Rosh Kadesh or, or any of the thing everything goes around the lunar cycle remember I told you there's only one Moed on the first day all the rest start around the a full moon do you know it's very easy to see a full moon very easy to see a full moon but when is the new moon when does that sliver of the moon suddenly appear it wasn't there last night and it's just a crescent sliver when when does that appear and so to, to set up Rosh Kadesh because if you're going to do something on the 15th of the month you got to know when the first of the month is how, how do you determine the first of the month and so the Sanhedrin set up a very simple rule we need two witnesses two witnesses who come in and 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 by the way you know they're all people who this this is what they did with their life they're, I want to be the one to see the new moon so everybody is is new moon conscious everybody's like, is that what do you hey Samuel what do you think no 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 Moshe that that, that no I, I don't, I don't see, what do you see there that's the flames from the candle over there you know it's like <laughs> And, and, and so all around Israel everybody's everybody's you know and there's a shepherd out there and he's with a sheep and he looks up 
and he drops his staff and he runs into Jerusalem and, and he says to the Sanhedrin, quick, come together, I've spotted the new moon. I saw it with my own eyes. And they would take him over to a chart and they would say, what did it look like? And they had pictures of different kinds of new moons. What were they doing? They were making sure he saw what he saw. Well, it was that one there. Well, no, it couldn't be that one there. That's not what it looks like. So, And then uh, an hour later, half an hour later, another person comes running in. Rabbis, rabbis, I, I saw it. And once they had two credible witnesses seeing it, that's the first of the month. And they lit bonfires, and the bonfire would go from Jerusalem and somewhat up, and the Galilee would see the fire there, and they'd light it, and it would go up, up into the Golan, and, and by bonfires, the, the word would go out, we now know this is the first day. If they expected it to be the first day, but there was no new moon, it wasn't the first day. So when they run in to the, to the, to the Sanhedrin, and they make this statement, we've seen the new moon. What is the response of the head of the Sanhedrin? Once they say, we got two witnesses, he says, no man knows the day or the hour. But now we do. When Yeshua said, no man knows the day or the hour, everybody listening to him knew exactly what he was saying. I'm, I can't tell you which Yom Teruah will be, but it will be on that day. That's right. Wow. That's right. Wow. Come on. Gentile thinkers are never going to wrap their head around what early first century people heard. Now, why would Yahweh want to tell us? And why would Yahweh want to, us to know that? So there's, there's many things you can do with Yom Teruah. Uh, one is uh, it's celebrated as the coronation of the king. Uh, I believe that. I believe when he comes back, that, that's the initiative of the coming coronation right. in heaven. When that trumpet sounds, and, and if, if that happens to be the time of the rapture, we're out of here. Mm -hmm. And we're up to get ready for the grand coronation of the King of Kings. Uh, others say uh, it's, it's a time of, of repentance. And I'm going to tell you more about that when we get to Yom Kippur, because we don't live in that day. Come on. Atonement has already been made. I am not questioning whether my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's right. And I'm not saying, you know, may your name be inscribed for another year. No, my name's been inscribed for eternity. Right. And so has yours. Yes. And that puts you in an entirely different place when you come to celebrate what atonement's all about. Okay? But one of the bit, and remember, we've, we've been talking in the month of Elul, the, the king is here, he's, he's with us. But what we got to realize is he's opening up a dimension of life. And you can hear. Mm -hmm. You can walk through your day hearing different things. Mm -hmm. You ever heard music that no one else hears? Mm -hmm. did, you, did you hear that? Hear what? I didn't hear anything. Oh, I, I just thought I heard. You ever heard birds sing and no one else hears them? Mm -hmm. Come on. All through your day, there is a dimension that is filled with sound. We know even in this dimension, this room is filled with all kinds of sound. Radio waves are going through, TV waves are going through. This, this is a very noisy room. If your ears were tuned to that frequency, you'd go, oh man, turn down the volume. Well, the sounds of heaven. I like that song that, what's his name, wrote? The sounds of heaven are all around us. Now listen to this. Yahweh sent his word and it healed them. Yahweh watches over his word to perform it. Yahweh hastens to fulfill his word. Yahweh's word will not return to him empty void without accomplishing its purpose. These are all scriptures. These are all words from a dimension beyond us of a creator who says, when I say it, I will never forsake it. 
That word can heal, that word can prosper, that word can change your future. The question is, what are you going to do with the word? And so the answer was this. You're going to shout about it. <laughs> You're going to get excited about it. Come on. Why is it that we would go to the bank and they give you a loan and you say, yay, I got a loan. But you open the Bible and God says, I'll meet all your needs. You don't come out and say, hey, I heard from God. He's going to meet my needs. Because we're bound in this dimension. But you and I are meant to live in this life. Hearing the sound of somewhere else. Come on. I, I've met people in my life I, I, I'll close with this. I, uh, Horace Fenton is one of them. Horace Fenton was a director of Latin America missions for years. And uh, I only spent maybe several hours with him on two different occasions. And, but the first time I met him, I was picking him up at the airport for a conference. Drove down to Boston. and Hi, Dr. Fenton. I'm Don Long. I'm going to be your chauffeur for the weekend. And uh, got in the car and just talked with him. The minute he sat in the seat and I sat next to him, it's like, I'm in the presence of a godly man. I'm in the presence of a godly man. He wasn't walking around like this. You know, he, he didn't have a reverse collar. He, he, he was a very jovial person, you know, had a big smile on his face and everything. It's just that when he talked, I was hearing wisdom. I was... I, I was hearing from heaven through him. It's like Yahweh was choosing to speak into this seminary student's life through his servant. And so his servant became the voice of Yahweh to me. A absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. I've got people in my life like that, 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 you know, that when I'm in their presence, I'm just, I, I'm, I, that's why I, I become silent. <laughs> this is not let's, let's talk together as if we're equals. I mean, we can talk, but, uh, but the minute you start talking, I choose to listen. Mary Frances is that way. Yes. Never, never forget the first time Mary Frances uh, came to IFC, and, and, and all I knew is we have this, this woman prophetess who's going to be ministering to us, and, and my pastor's bringing her in, so why wouldn't I open my life to what she has to say? And, you know, she's blonde and whatever, and going through her little, you know, Tennessee talk and all this. <clears throat> and then, then she says, well, let's get started. And she says something like, Abba, Abba, Abba. And man, I went somewhere I'd never been. One word, Abba, Abba. It, it was a, well, you know him. I pray to him, but just the way you're saying Abba, you know him. I know about him, I love him, and, and I've committed my life to follow him, but I'm in the presence of somebody who, when, when, you, when you say Abba, he answers yes. I say Abba and pray for the next 20 minutes and don't even know if he heard me. So by faith, I believe he heard me, because the Bible says he heard me. That's not a relationship. I was in the presence of somebody who knows what that other dimension is like. And you and I have the opportunity, whether we're adults or, or young people, children, of developing a, an intimacy with our Heavenly Father so that we are the ones who speak into the lives of others just the way we talk, just the way we are. We bring the presence with us. Amen. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Father, we thank you and praise you for your love for us. Thank you for the moeds that we're about to enter into. Thank you for this one that we have so much more to dig into and explore. Thank you for a day of rest. Tomorrow may it indeed be a day of rest. A day when we rest in you. For true rest is not simply because we're sitting. It's because we're sitting in your presence. And so may the, the Sabbath of tomorrow be filled with moments where we have a, an encounter with our heavenly Abba that is so real that we know that we know that we know that you love us. We know that we know that it is your desire to speak to us. And we can say with full confidence, 
all is well in our family. In the name of Yeshua and God's people said, Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua, your God, your Father, release abundant blessings into your life. May he release a rest that is supernatural into your body. And may the day be filled with your remembering of how good he has been to you. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, turn to somebody and say, I'm sure glad I was here tonight.